again, guys, I began. So, chapter 3, if you remember, 3 1 was about overall prices. And overall prices in the economy were determined by the value of money. Okay? And value of money is exactly the same as purchasing power of money. Purchasing power of money. <coughs> Which we just call P P M. And purchasing power of money, that's kind of like one of the last sections, is determined by demand, of money. demand for money and supply for money. We also said that a shift in demand for money will change the purchasing power and the value and a shift in supply will change purchasing power of money and the value of money. Let's see what else we have. So, again, section number two. Prices change because demand for money changes or because supply for money changes. So that's section number three, two. Purchasing power of money depends on demand and supply. Okay. And next, again, okay, shift in demand and shift in supply will change this. And now comes the next most important question. It's simple and it's logical. What determines changes in demand for money and what determines changes in supply? For money. And this is what we're going to discuss today and tomorrow. Changes in the supply of money is chapter 4. Okay, that's what chapter 4 is. And changes in demand of money is. Chapter 5. So, chapter 4 is devoted to supply and chapter 5 to demand. Alright, so 3 2 was that demand for money and supply for money affect purchasing power of money. 4. Money supply. Page 43. So, definition. Alright, let's first get out the definition of money. 
definition of money is, let's repeat it from the first or second class, generally accepted medium of exchange. Medium of exchange means it serves to make a payment. So, generally accepted. If it is generally accepted, then medium of exchange, then it is money. Now, what is money supply? And that's, again, the second paragraph is the total number of currency units. The total number of currency units. So, as many dollars as you have, as many real. You just add up the number of units. All right. We discussed that one mechanism to increase the money supply is debasement. Debasement means lowering the precious metal of a coin, the precious metal content of a coin. So, we, when you have debasement, debasement causes money supply to increase. The increase in money supply is the profit, the gain of those who debase the money. It is in their interest. If you're the king, if you're the government, the government likes to debase money. It wants to debase money because part of that money they can call, keep for themselves and pocket for themselves. Uh, the standard method of debasement is recoinage. Recoinage means collecting all old coins and then issuing brand new coins. It's a replacement for the old one. So if you give me your old coin, after three days or ten days, I'll give you back a new coin. Sometimes they'll have a few coins already available. So you give me ten of your coins, I give you back ten new coins. The trick is that the new coin is going to look like and will be shiny like and will be heavy like the old one. But inside, there will be less gold and more base metals like copper and zinc and iron and whatever other cheap metals they will put inside. So, recoinage is a simple mechanism for debasement. All right. For one. For one says, what should be the optimal money supply? A lot of times people complain there is not enough money in the country. If we have more money, we will be better off, right? Wrong. Totally and completely wrong. You may double the amount of money, you will not be better off. And she will not be better off and no one will be better off. You say, yeah, but I have twice more money. Well, here's the trick. If you have twice more money, but they don't, then you're better off. You can buy more things. But you have twice more money, and she got twice more money, and she got twice more money, and he's got twice more money, and everybody else got twice more money, then prices will more or less double, and you will not be better off. So, by increasing money supply, okay, so when money supply goes up, the only thing that will happen is that purchasing power will go down, and as a result, everybody having more money, no one is better off. That's important to understand. So, for Part 4.1, they say, what should the supply of money be? 
we state as in optimal, optimal money supply. Optimal money supply. Optimal means the best. What is the best money supply? Should the government issue 1 billion or 2 billion or 10 billion or 1 trillion or 10 trillion or 100 trillion? What is the optimal money supply? And there is a surprising answer. Any money supply is optimal. Any money supply is good. If you just put in one billion dollars, the economy will run with one billion dollars. If you put in one trillion dollars, the economy will run with one trillion dollars. Any money supply is optimal. In other words, money, money serves the function of indirect exchange. Indirect exchange. If you have one million units, you will generate a certain indirect exchange. If you have twice more money, you will still get the same indirect exchange. You'll still buy the same amount of water, you'll still buy the same amount of juice, you'll still buy the same type of motorcycle. So, trade between people and economic activity does not change. There is no benefit of increased money supply. If you increase money supply, the only thing that will happen is prices will fall. Sorry, rise. My purchasing power will fall. So, there is no, we call, social benefit to increasing money supply. You can reduce money supply, and again, there is no social benefit to reducing money supply. Okay, so that's extremely important to understand. So, when some people want to change money supply, or increase money supply, or say, oh, we can stimulate the economy with money supply, this means that there are some other benefits to some particular groups. Means some people will benefit and some people will lose. And that's what we're trying to discuss over the next or so hours. All right. So, what is the social benefit? Social benefit depends on, okay, let's call it wealth. Wealth, that's elementary economics. Wealth is kind of like welfare. In other words, how much food you have, how much water, how much cars, and how much material welfare. Wealth and welfare depends on production, what you're going to produce. It depends on simple things like how many fields of rice you have, how many watch factories, how many shirt factories, how many belt factories you have, okay? How many computer phones. In other words, Wealth and welfare in a country, in a nation, whether a nation is rich or poor, depends on production that you produce. And production depends on capital. Capital is machines and equipment. Now, the most important lesson to understand is that you can't print a million dollars or billion dollars or trillion dollars and make the economy better. It is impossible. It's impossible to get this little piece of paper, right? And I'll print one billion dollar, one billion dollar, one billion dollar. I can create maybe 10 banknotes out of a sheet. I can take thousand sheets and suddenly create one trillion dollars. Don't think that by creating or printing one trillion dollars, anyone is better off. Society is not better off because capital did not change, production did not change, 
quantity of gasoline didn't change, electricity didn't change, rice didn't change, the quantity of water didn't change. In other words, the real assets and production in the economy didn't change, and therefore, wealth and welfare, welfare cannot possibly change. Printing money, increasing money cannot change the social welfare. Yes, somebody will get a little richer and somebody will get a little poorer, and I'll explain that. Let me get back to my page, what was it? 40. Overall prices, okay. All right, next one is very simple, money balance. Or money balances. Money balance is simply how much money you have right now. Well, I have 10, $15. $15 is my money balance. Money balance is $15. So the money supply here is the total of everyone's money balances. Okay? So that's a very simple concept to understand. The next simple concept to understand is that money does not circulate. They tell you money flows around in the economy. If money flows around and floats in the economy, please tell me where it flows so I can go and take the money. Money does not flow. Money does only one thing. It stays in someone's money balance. It stays in your pocket. When you make an exchange for one hundredth of a second, you get the money and I get the water. But the next second, the money is in your money balance. Same as cash balance. So that's the next simple thing to understand. Cash balance. Money balance, the same as cash balance, is what people have. Money doesn't flow in the economy. It doesn't circulate. Money stays only in cash balance. The money supply equals the total of cash balances. Equals everyone's cash balances. Total of everyone's cash balances. Again, that concept that money is transferred from one person to another is on page 44 and 45. 44, 45. Okay, when money supply increases, all you do is you say you dilute the purchasing power. When money supply increases, this is, guys pay attention now, very important, called inflation, inflation. This is the true and correct, the only correct definition of inflation. Increasing in prices is not inflation. Increasing in prices is a consequence of inflation. So, inflation has cause and inflation has consequence. The cause is rising in money supply and the consequence is a rise in prices. Don't confuse the consequence with the cause. Governments want people to confuse consequence with the cause and there's a simple reason. When prices increase the only cause that can possibly increase, and I'll be discussing it over the next two, three, four hours, is increase in money supply. An increase in money supply is strictly caused by the government, okay? But the government doesn't want to say, oh, prices go up, it's our fault. It's fault, all this government blames greedy businessmen. 
It blames somebody else. They blame the weather. They blame foreigners. They like to blame speculators, okay, for driving prices up. But speculators cannot drive prices up. Example, housing prices now in Cambodia and in Thailand, they just keep going up and up and up and up. Maybe over the last one or two years less, but the last five or ten years a lot. Well, they can blame now, blame the Koreans, right? They come and buy all the houses, blame the Chinese, right? Well, they can blame the, the rest of the world, but at the end of the day, where do people get the money to pay for it? All right? Somehow, if they get the money, means that money supply must have increased if people have twice the money to pay for double the price of the house or of the apartment. So either money has increased a lot or credit has increased a lot. Let's see, social benefit and all of this stuff. All right, I already discussed a little bit. It's called, it's very simple, that's page 46. Page 46 is known as the angel Gabriel model. Angel Gabriel model. That's on page 46, the very first line. Simply, the angel Gabriel is you know, it's part of Christian culture uh, or Christian religion. Suddenly says, oh, I'm a nice, good spirit. I will help everybody and I will double the amount of your money. And I will double the amount of your money. And double the amount of your money. And double the amount of everybody's money in the economy. And I'll do a great good by doubling everyone's money. Well, you see your money twice more this, the next morning, you wake up, oh, I, instead of 300, I got 600. And you, instead of 3,000, I got 6,000, right? So what do you do? You go out in the morning and try and decide, oh, I'm going to spend a little bit of money, right? So you start spending money and within a few short hours or within a few short days, what the only thing that's going to happen is prices will start rising. Okay, you go try buy meat, you go try buy iPhones, whatever you keep buying, is you, you're buying or whatever you want to buy, suddenly prices will go up. You want to buy a motorcycle, motorcycle prices will be driven up. You want to buy cigarettes, cigarettes. You want to buy beer, whatever, rice, and all prices will go up and prices will adjust as quickly as people begin to spend their extra money. So, in the Angel Gabriel model, money supply goes up, and the result is that very, very soon, very, very soon, prices will go up. And if Angel Gabriel doubles the money supply, you will get more or less double the price increase. The result is that nobody is better off. But, here's the trick. Some people seeing the money will rush early at 7 o'clock in the morning to do some spending. So you start shopping in the mall, start buying things, and other people will spend money at 8 o'clock, others will spend money at 9 o'clock, but there are others who pretty much have everything. They got the iPhone and the Apple machine and the car and the motorcycle, they got everything they need, so they're not going to spend a lot of that money and they decide to wait, wait a day, wait a week, wait a month. Well, what will happen to those people who actually decide to wait? What will happen is that you see early on the low prices, your money is doubled, you're going to be buying more and more when the prices are still cheap. So, you as an early spender of money will benefit because you see the low prices and someone who waits for a week or for a month and the prices rise they will see a low benefit they may even lose in the process so here is the next early trick that's very simple early spenders early spenders those who spend money soon or quicker we're calling 
early or quick spenders. Early spenders benefit. Early spenders benefit. It is beneficial to spend the money quick. In other words, if three years ago housing prices were lower and two years ago prices housing prices were higher, let's say you could buy an apartment for 50,000 and the next year 60,000, those who buy quicker at 50 will benefit and they will benefit more than those who buy at 60. And the late, late spenders So, early on, you buy all the orange, oranges you want, you buy all the iPhones you want. iPhones, there will be a relative shortage, and prices of iPhones may more than double, they can increase more. Than so, essentially, remember, the number of goods of watches, phones, eggs, rice did not change. If somebody spends the money early and benefits, it follows that somebody else, the late spenders, might well, will lose. Well, this idea of some people benefiting and others losing is a form of redistribution. Is a form of redistribution. Getting money or wealth or power from some people and giving it to others. Okay, so this redistribution is an indirect form of tax where those who benefit effectively extracted a benefit or a tax from those who lose. Okay, so that's the second important point to understand. So early spenders benefit. And now comes the next very simple thing. Let's see if it's in the text. Well, it is in the textbook. Where exactly? Okay. So that's again at the very end, bottom of page forty-six. Early spenders, those lucky folks who rushed out the next morning, you know, before the prices went out they certainly benefit. Okay. Overall, there is no social benefit. That's the most important thing to understand. There is no social benefit to increasing money supply. It's the same amount of rice the same quantity of rice, the same quantity of water, the same quantity, but some people benefited and some people lost. That's important to understand. So, what is the optimal money supply? The short answer is anything. Whatever the money supply is, any money supply is optimal as prices will adjust to that money supply. In other words, purchasing power will adjust. That's section number one. Or section number two. Four, two. Supply of gold. And Alright, so now suppose we are on a gold standard. Gold standard means society uses gold as money. And on a gold standard means that people use gold coins of certain quality and certain weight as money. 
And the wood has been a gold standard for thousands of years. Well, Rome had, for almost thousand years, most of the money were silver and some of the money were gold. The Arab world was, for almost thousand years, almost entirely on a gold standard. So the whole Arab world has been on gold, okay? America has been for a while in silver and later on in gold. Uh, Great Britain has been on a silver standard. Oh, let's write it out. Silver. Standard. And later on, Great Britain switched from silver to gold, where the British pound was backed entirely by gold. So suppose the country is on a gold standard. How do you increase money supply? First of all, on a gold standard, what is money supply? On a gold standard, money supply is simply the quantity of gold in circulation, including gold which you may wear as a jewelry. It's not a coincidence, it's actually very historic that most women in India will wear their gold as jewelry. And whenever necessary, they'll take the jewelry out. And if the jewelry is certain purity, as it is in uh, India, they'll take the jewelry out and they'll use it for payments or to pay back debt. So the jewelry will have the dual function of making and looking beautiful and at the same time as uh, wearing uh, or having your money with you. But instead of putting your money in your pocket, you put it up here in a whatever, or you put it on your earrings, or however else women may wear jewelry. Well, it's exactly the same situation in the Arab world. In the Arab world, uh, women will be wearing a lot of gold, and that's kind of like part of the culture. Okay, uh, we have in Europe, well, you know, they kind of come out of Indian gypsies, and gypsies will also wear all of their gold everywhere, and they will be showing off their gold, and the gold that they show is part of their social status. But when it comes to something, they use it as a money substitute. Well, it is their money. While it's jewelry, it serves. So when you have money, you can put it in the bank and earn interest. That's the benefit of having it and holding. Or you might as well wear it and look nice and beautiful, okay? And when you need it tomorrow morning, you can take a piece of it and make a payment. So, on a gold standard, when gold is money, the money supply is simply determined by the amount of gold. That's the amount of gold determines the gold supply. So the only way to increase money supply on a gold standard is very simple. You have to dig more gold out of the ground. Now, what determines gold digging in the ground? Is everybody going to rush and dig gold out of the ground and become a gold miner? The short answer is no. Some people will not, when they start digging gold, they will not be able to do and dig out a lot of gold because they don't know how to do, because they don't have the equipment. Uh, so, gold digging is an activity like any others. Uh, some people will do iron metal, some people will grow rice, others will grow chicken and horses, okay? So, gold digging will be determined by the overall productivity. If the economy is relatively little productive, okay, some people will be digging gold will be little productive. If the economy improves productivity, some of these people will use and produce gold. So overall gold production will be determined by the overall productivity of the economy. Because if you get too many people to start digging gold, it will not be profitable for many people to dig gold. There's not enough gold in the ground. And even if there is enough, they will not be able to dig gold quick enough. For 99% of the people, it will be not worth their time to dig 
gold. Okay? So gold increases money supply rises with productivity. And if goods and services increase by 3%, roughly gold will increase by 2 or 3%. If goods and services roughly within 10 years double, gold will roughly double. So, you know, gold standard money supply or gold rises together with all the other goods. It will not rise a lot faster, it will not rise a lot slower. So, on a gold standard long term, gold prices or money will maintain stable prices. In a gold standard, prices cannot rise from a year to a year to a year. It is impossible because money supply cannot rise faster than the goods and the services. Money supply will just rise, meaning supply of gold will rise with the supply of rice and other goods. So, in a gold standard, prices are stable. Well, that's the one way. The one way is digging gold. Now, the other way is, let's see, the mechanism of Counterfeiting. Well, what is counterfeiting? Counterfeiting is you take something yellow and you pass it to other people as gold. Okay? So, in a counterfeiting process, you get fake money and sell them as real gold. So, counterfeiting will result in increasing money. Supply. In a counterfeiting process, here's the trick. There is a counterfeiter. And if I am the counterfeiter, and I can counterfeit, let's say, $5 billion, imagine what can happen. I'm going to buy houses, I'm going to buy cars, I'm going to buy a whole bunch of things. As a counterfeiter, the important point is that the counterfeiter benefits or profits from the counterfeiting operation. So, if you can just print money in the basement, and you can print one billion, sure, you will benefit. Whoever counterfeits gold, or whoever counterfeits money, does benefit. And again, the counterfeiting process did not increase the amount of rice and water, so the counterfeiting process results in redistribution. Re The counterfeiter benefits at other people. The counterfeiter benefits at other people. Now, counterfeiting is fraud. Now, let's... Next is page 49. And discuss the... Inflation process. And inflation processes, let's say the following. I get $1 billion. What I'm going to do, I'm going to buy houses. Now, imagine I start buying houses. I buy one house, a second house, a third house, a fourth house, okay? Plus, I can buy 100 houses. Well, I can easily buy 1,000 houses or apartment, 10,000 houses. Now, imagine me going and out on the market, then within a couple of weeks or a couple of months, buying thousand or ten thousand apartments in Phnom Penh. What's going to happen? First, housing prices will go up, 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 and up. Now, me, I will certainly benefit. I just printed one billion dollars, or I just faked a lot of gold. Me, I certainly benefit from it. Well, who is the next beneficiary? First, I was buying them from 50,000, then to 60,000, 70,000, 100,000, 120,000. You know, uh, I can't buy everything at 50 or 60,000. Some people will not sell unless they get 150 to 200,000. So here's the next important point. As I buy more and more and more and more houses, 
housing owners seeing their housing prices double and triple will benefit. So if I spend my money on housing, housing owners will benefit. They will get the first biggest benefit out of the money. They'll get most of the benefit of the new counterfeit money. Well, who is going to get the second benefit out of it? Well, housing prices just doubled. Now, construction company, they can build more housing, and as they build more housing, they'll build the housing at the slightly lower cost, the same old lower cost. And before, let's say, a house will cost 40000 to build, okay? And they sell it for 50000 and they get a 20% profit margin. That's their gain. Now the house is worth $100,000. They still build it, build it for $40,000, and they can sell the house for $60,000. They can benefit almost as much. In other words, their profit will be very high. But here's the thing. If you own the houses and you sell your houses to me instead of $50,000 for $100,000, you benefit a lot of money quickly. You benefit immediately. The construction company will also benefit a lot, but it will take a little bit of time. They'll need to maybe six months or a year to build a house before they can sell it. But they will definitely benefit a lot. Well, who's the next to benefit? So the construction, yo, so the housing owners make the first benefit. They get the biggest, quickest gain. The second biggest gain, not as quick, will be definitely for the construction company. Who gets the third benefit? Well, all of those construction workers. Suddenly, you will have a boom in construction. You will need more and more and more construction workers. They will get a little higher salary, right? They work, you know, they might not be getting, let's say, $10 a day. They'll get $12 a day, $13. So construction workers will get some benefit out of the inflation. Well, who else? Well, materials. You have a copper, you have any kind of building materials, these people will benefit. Now, what are the workers going to do? They're going to go buy some rice, buy some food, buy some drink. So, they're going to give a boost to the food industry. Okay? So, you see how the economy, the biggest benefit, the one billion dollars will go to the housing. On the second round, will go to the construction companies. On the third round, it's going to go to the materials companies and workers. On the fourth round, it's going to spread out. So the wealth begins to spread out. And now there is a feeling that the economy is booming and doing great. The answer is wrong. The economy is not booming. It's an illusion. All I did was counterfeit one billion dollars. Okay, and all I did is I started spending and now the money keeps flowing around the economy. Well, after 10 or 15 or 20 cycles, and all the workers spend it on food, now the people on food uh, spend it on the farmers, the prices in the overall economy will begin to rise. And if I increase the money supply by 10%, overall prices will get by 10%. Well, is everybody going to get is everybody going to get some of that money? No. You will have some teacher who's working for $400 a month, and the teacher's salary will not increase. So the teacher will see higher prices and higher inflation, but the teacher will lose. Another one that may lose will be the nurse who is on a fixed salary. So most workers who are on a fixed salary salary will definitely lose because not everyone uh, the salary will adjust so in this inflation process if you spend the money in a certain area the money starts falling around the people on fixed income lose same thing happens with let's say if we spend the money on guns and weapons the military industry will benefit then all the engineers in the military industry, then all the suppliers will benefit, then all the soldiers will be benefit, but again, the teachers, the nurses, and 
older people who don't have income. And sometimes you will drive the prices up, but the price of rice will not go up as much. So the farmers will get the curve. So inflation process, money flows from sector to sector, but it doesn't reach every corner of the economy. It reaches maybe half the economy. And that half of the economy will benefit, and the other half of the economy will be losers. That's the meaning, that's the purpose, that's the essence of the inflation process and of counterfeiting, is to redistribute wealth from those who are able to counterfeit and those who spend money first. We call these the early spenders. In other words, the benefit goes to those who get the money early and those who get the money late get and there are some people who never get any of that money anyway. That's the whole thing about increasing money supply and about the inflation process. Let's see what we have. All right, that's uh, good enough. Uh, we take a 10 minute break and then we continue with section three, uh, government paper money and a few other things. Uh, we need to uh, make up class tomorrow.